Well, good morning, uh, and welcome to the second PebblePad ePortfolio Symposium at Griffith University. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathering today and pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to the indigenous people. Thank you for braving the rain. Um, I know we have people from other countries where it rains a lot and uh, they were hoping to come to Queensland sunshine, but uh, no such luck. So thank you for braving the rain to come to the first event of Celebrating Teaching 2017. We have three more events happening next week, uh, so you might want to look online for those as well. Together we are gathered, today uh, we are gathering to celebrate um, those that have been innovating, taking risks, uh, the first and second trimester. If you saw on the screen before, a list of names looping around that are innovators and the people that are critical to supporting them. And we are honored that they have decided to share their experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly, so we can learn from them um, and be inspired by them. Just a year ago, I stood here and uh, introduced the DVCA, uh, Professor Deborah Henley, who announced that we entered a three-year partnership with PebblePad. So it is amazing to think of what has happened in just a one-year uh, term. We were inspired by Beverly Oliver, who um, beamed in from Deakin um, to get us going on that. We heard from people that had tried it. We had a couple academics that had piloted Pebble Pad and to share their ideas. But we had a lot of different e-portfolio activities happening within the institution. So we had other academics as well sharing their experiences, not particular with one platform, uh, but just in general. So where we've come is to date, uh, this year in 2017, we have about 190 courses in which the academics and their design teams have embedded the use of PebblePad in support of student-centered learning activities. Um, and from that were generated 9,000 active users. So I think we should give everybody a hand here for not the fact that we are 9,000 users of PebblePad, but that we've inter implemented an innovative technology in innovative ways and are engaging with so many people. So let's uh, give ourselves a hand for that. And could we see the hands of anybody that was involved in helping get PebblePad um, implemented in those 190 classes? So any academics, any BL blended learning advisors, curriculum consultants, educational designers, technical support people? That's right. So if you look around, when we talk about the implementation team of this particular uh, platform, everybody in that group is a part of that team. If it weren't for every single member in there, our students wouldn't be having the experiences that they are. And so uh, I think that's critical. It's, it's everybody's. It's truly uh, a village, to quote uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. OK, that's my only American reference right there. So last year, I had to face the election. So at least I don't have to talk about that. Um, I just did want to mention that uh, yesterday at the DVCA's academic forum, she did uh, acknowledge that the courses, the number of courses, and the number of people that are engaging in the platform. And if you weren't here last year, you might not know that she's the one who really put forth the, that's okay, I'll just use my teacher voice. She's the one who has championed the implementation of the platform uh, to support student-centered learning employability. And without her leadership at that high level, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. So just acknowledging her, but that she acknowledged the efforts that this whole group was making um, at the same time. Okay. So we also want to welcome, we have people from a multitude of universities. So if you're from outside Griffith, would you mind raising your hand? All right. So if you see them stumbling around looking like they need coffee or something, point them in the right correction, direction to coffee. Thank you guys for coming. And, and there are some of you that I believe came from Perth uh, or Western Australia. Is that OK? Now, you may think you got the award for traveling the farthest, but indeed not. So we actually have a team from the homeland of Pebble Pad 
They have come to us. And so we have Shane, who we're going to hear from in a minute. And we have Brad, as well as Aaron. Right? And so, um, and they're the people that are disappointed we're not sunny Queensland this week. But um, anyway, so they win the award and they're joined by Allison and Jody, which are the Pebble Pad support team here with them. Would you two raise your hands? All right. Anybody else who hasn't had a chance to raise their hand today, just raise your hand because <laughs> you're here. Okay, you've been. <laughs> um, so I hope that each one of you uh, walks away from today with at least one idea that you can take back and you can implement in support of students. If you're an academic, if you're a support service, well, it doesn't matter what role you play, but I, I would think um, if you have at least one idea, um, then, then that will, I would hope, have made it worth your time. To help facilitate that, uh, you'll see a URL on here. Unfortunately, I'm gonna say for right now, this is just for internal Griffith folks. This is a workbook that um, Megan Duffy, Megan, raise your hand. All right, she's our manager of the implementation of PebblePad, has created, um, which will lead you through some reflections in the different sections. And uh, in terms of trying to practice what we preach, the idea that you will have your reflections, all the information about the sessions in one space that you can find again, that you don't have to figure out where's that piece of paper that you wrote those notes on and now you can't find. So trying to model this idea of um, saving these resources in a single space. And maybe next year, who knows, uh, hint, hint, uh, people from PebblePad, that we could share this with external people who have PebblePad accounts. So, you know, that might be a functionality. That might be nice. So here's the developers. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. Now, going to some logistics. So we are in this room uh, in the beginning and then at the very end of the day. Uh, the toilets for the females are out and to the right and for the males out and to the left. If there's an emergency, we, I feel like an airline stewardess. We want to go out the back, follow the ladies in red, and uh, they will lead you to someplace safe, which is my hope. Okay. Um, let's see, what else is on my list here? Uh, the breakout sessions are going to be in the campus heart. Um, again, you can follow the people in red, but we'll be going out and to the right around uh, 260 degrees and above roses. So if you want, and then we'll have um, morning tea, coffee, and biscuits. Is that correct, Tina? All right. Tina can raise her hand. She's uh, organizer extraordinaire along with Wynn. So. All right, so that's all the details. Um, with uh, no further ado, I'd like to invite Shane up. Uh, I uh, joked with him I was going to call him a recovering academic um, because in a past life, that's uh, what he was. And uh, he's going to give us some insights about the past, present, and the future. Thanks so much, Shane. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for sitting so far back. <laughs> <laughs> and particularly in the high chairs. It's much easier for me. Far too low down here. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm Shane Sutherland, I'm kind of, um, I have various titles, I'm founder of PebblePad, uh, CEO, uh, chief troublemaker and stuff. I'm making a note of that uh, feature request, Heidi, that's now number 138 on our list that we've gathered over the last couple of days. Um, do I have to switch? Okay. Oh, perfect. Um, does anybody know an uh, 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 academic author called Murray Print? Yeah, a bit of a nod at the back. So Murray Print wrote, uh, once upon a life, thank you. Um, I worked in a school of education at the University of Wolverhampton. And um, one of the subjects I taught was curriculum design. And Murray Print, an Australian academic, wrote a book on, on curriculum design. Um, and he talked about different kinds of curricula. Um, the mandated curricula. You know, that which you're supposed to teach. The government or some professional body might tell you to teach that. Um, the planned curricula, so how you turn that into something you're going to deliver at your institution. Um, the available curricula, because some of the things you want to do may not be possible because you don't have sim labs or you don't have enough qualified staff or you can't get access to the rooms you want. Um, then there's the um, delivered curricula and then the curricula that students experience. Um, Today, this is the available curricula. I was in town. Heidi said, could you do a talk? And here I am. So uh, I was really nervous, actually, especially when I heard that Beverly Oliver was, did last year's talk, because Beverly is pretty famous. Um, and I don't know a lot about anything. Um, I know 
The, my space test subject obviously is Pebble Pad. I know some other stuff, but an awful lot about very little. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do my best to kind of keep you sort of um, entertained, I think. Um, one of the, the other things that Murray Print talked about was um, when designing uh, curricula, excuse me, um, you should include, one of, the, one of his kind of categories was interest. And he said you should include things which are of interest to your learners and in their interest. Um, and I think the thing we find with Pebble Pad is it's very often um, not interesting to them, particularly in kind of first and second year. Uh, you do it because you believe it's in their interest. And often you kind of wading through treacle or uh, swimming uphill or any other number of mixed metaphors. Um, it's hard work and you have, to, you have to kind of believe in it. You have to fight back. Sometimes there are tears and tantrums, but you do it because you believe that it's the right thing to do. Um, and we've been doing this for a while now. Um, and I was chatting to Lynn McAllister uh, at the beginning of this, because Lynn's been involved in this for about 10 years, probably longer actually, but I met Lynn about 10 years ago. And um, portfolios have gone through lots of cycles. People got excited about them, then they fell off a cliff, and then there's a bit more excitement came back. I think what's happening right now is there's a... Um, I, I keep talking about this uh, idea of a shift, uh, sorry, a lack of confidence in content or a crisis of confidence in content because knowing stuff is kind of no longer the mark of a strong graduate. It's about being able to do stuff. Um, there's a worldwide um, interest in employability or future readiness or work readiness, however you kind of frame that. Um, there's much more interest in what students have experienced and what they gain from that experience. Uh, we see that through uh, growing work integrated learning opportunities, through study abroad, through large scale projects, through collaborative learning. And all of those things I think are making platforms like PebblePad um, uh, increasingly important. Um, so how did we get here, I guess, is the thrust of the, of the talk. Um, about 10 years ago, sometime in 2007, um, we were at a, a college uh, in London called Good Enough College. Now, you might wonder why you'd send someone to a college called Good Enough. And not, uh, but uh, there's another college in England actually called uh, Indefatigable. That's quite... Uh, but um, anyway... Um, we met there a bunch of folks, um, including Jill, Wendy, and Kim, who are still both working just down the road, um, and Cole McCowan. I mean, are those names familiar to any of you? Some people are nodding their heads. And Cole, in particular, said, hey, we've got this event coming up in Brisbane um, in February 2008, and we think you should come along and tell people all about PebblePad. Now, we had absolutely no intention of selling PebblePad over here, but... The UK uh, in, uh, Department of International Shenanigans was giving money away at the time for people to go and try and sell their wares overseas. And um, having never been to Australia, it seemed like a good idea. Uh, <laughs> so uh, myself and my colleague, Colin, the co-founder of the business, we flew over and we came to Brisbane and uh, we went to this AEP showcase, Australian ePortfolio um, Symposium, sorry. Um, and we thought, in fact, to, in order to f um, fulfill the requirements of the, um, the grant, we had to have other business visits while we were here. So we went, in fact, we kind of set up visits in uh, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, Adelaide. I can't remember, actually. I put Tasmania in just for dramatic effect. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember if that was the first or the second visit. But actually, before we got to Sydney, we had a call from, and I think it was Murdoch, it might have been Edith Cowan, but I think it was Murdoch, someone said, we've heard what you're doing, we heard you're in town, more or less, uh, <laughs> could, 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 could you pop over and tell us all, and, and we did, because we thought, well, yeah, it's just another town in Australia. <laughs> And so, and in fact, I say we did, my, my colleague did, because I had to make another date in. But Colin flew overnight to Perth, did a thing in Perth that day, and then flew back and met me in Sydney. 
And it was only later we realised that that's more than going to Moscow from London. <laughs> so, and if, if someone rang us from Moscow and said, hey, could you come over tomorrow and tell us all about Pelpad? You, you must be joking, it's mad. <laughs> but the whole kind of sense of distance and stuff changes when you're over here. So that, that's what we did. And, um, and we, oh, this, by the way, I just wanted to show this just because while I was here, I mean, clearly, coming to Australia for the first time, we were worried we'd be killed by snakes or spiders or other deadly things. Um, this was a picture taken in um, the Botanical Gardens, actually. Uh, it turns out it's not a killer spider, but uh, they all looked dangerous to me. Um, but this is from 2008, and in fact, if I go into my Pebble Pad account now, we've gone through something like, I don't know, 30 versions, three really major re revisions, and, um, and I can still get to stuff I first put in in 2004, um, which I think is quite a claim, actually, because, but it's important to us, because if you're building a system which is for lifelong, life-wide learning, you can't keep on at different points just chopping people's stuff off. So um, this was a picture I took in 2008 at Brisbane. Um, anywho, um, we did this um, at the ePortfolio Symposium. We had the opportunity to show our wares, so to speak. Um, you'll see we're up against some, some competition there. Um, and we did our, our presentation. And as a result of the visits everywhere, and then this presentation, um, we, we accidentally, and I, I genuinely mean accidentally, got some customers. Because we, ha I mean, ha we had no intention of working with Australians. Uh, um, but we did, we ended up some, met some really, really lovely people and, um, and, and I think what's also happened is the practice over here has genuinely influenced and has led what goes on elsewhere. Some really, really innovative stuff takes place over here. Um, so uh, we, we did, as part of all of this kind of thing, a, a presentation of PebblePad. Um, and at the end, a chap we'd never met before called uh, Harry Owen. Uh, Professor Harry Owen, who's at Flinders. Anyone know Harry? Besides Alison? No, he's a really decent guy. And he said, uh, that's just not fair. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you've given no one any chance here. And that was, it was quite nice to hear. We'd come a long way. And, and I thought I'd try and work out what, what I think now he meant by that. Um, and it was these kind of things. Um, We'd been using PebblePad at the University of Wolverhampton until, since 2004. So we had a real big body of work with thousands of students using it in lots of different subjects. Uh, we weren't just talking about what was possible. We were showing what had actually happened and the effects on, on learners and learning. Um, and it's, it's really interesting how, um, I think I mentioned this yesterday to Deborah. Um, I still go to conferences and I hear people talking about their e-portfolio implementation projects, you know, where they've, they've um, scoured the landscape, they've chosen a platform, they've done all of this stuff, and their 12 students have turned in their first portfolios. And I was chatting to, to your team yesterday, and, and as um, Heidi just said, 190 courses, 9,000 users. The scale is just mind-blowing, actually, and you should genuinely be really, really proud of what you've done. Um, but in 2004, there was very little practice going on. We were able to show that practice. Um, you know, we're, we're vendors. Well, we've, at the time, maybe we weren't. It was probably on the cusp of when I left the university, because when the business started, it was still, it was like a spin-out company thing. And uh, being a vendor is terrible. And you're all to blame for this, because, you know, when you go to trade, like Ascolite or some old theatre, and we have a little stand, and everyone does like a big arc around the stand, so you don't get, you know, I don't know, you, you think you're coming to the influence and we make you buy stuff you don't want. But being associated with the university was really, really good. Uh, it gave us a kind of in. Um, I think what was also maybe, I keep wanting to use the word remarkable because I've seen it on your T-shirts. Uh, but we, I had, we were doing the presentation like this and uh, my colleague Colin, who's quite little, so he didn't show up very well, he sat on the floor. And then partway through, he took a photograph on, the mo on a mobile device, and the mobile was connected to the internet, and before you knew it, that picture of the group we were talking to appeared inside the platform. So we were demonstrating, I guess, our commitment to mobile users, you know, being able to make reflections wherever you happen to be. Um, that was quite impressive. And I think um, 
people really like what we stood for. Uh, learning and learner-centered philosophy was important to folks. Now, I'm not sure if this breaks your stream. Can I click on, go to the interweb? Thanks. So, uh, boom, boom, boom. Oh, is it rustling on my chin? I have too many of them. Thanks. I can't even see this little dialogue box on here. Let me just... oh, this could take a while. Oh, no, there we go. So this was, this was the presentation um, we gave. But it's not quite... Uh, um, in 2008, we talked about uh, this kind of place in the middle, you know, these institutional systems, sorry, social systems, institutional systems, and how PebblePad was kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, I'll come back to how hard it is to describe what PebblePad is later. Um, we talked about some of the issues we were trying to address and how we were addressing them. And then I probably spent about an hour going through how all the bits kind of worked together. So this is what we did back in 2008. And then we went and showed some examples of practice. So presumably if I close that, I'll go back to the PowerPoint uh, and move on. Um, and what we showed at that time when we went on to the, because we did, actually we did quite a small presentation. Then we did the, the pebble pad thing. How many people have seen that in real life? Chris. <laughs> so this, this was like, pro this was classic. This was proper pebble pad classic. Um, it was so old, like, we, we had about 11 users maybe. No, we haven't. We had like, dug the bug. So if any user found a problem with the system, they hit dug the bug and they wrote some stuff and we found out what was going on. And you hit a pebble. And actually, I've still got the real pebble. That's a photograph of a pebble we found near a canal, and it became the button. You know, it's a bit like it was a proper cottage industry. There were three of us at one point working above my garage, building this, uh, and then we sold it to unsuspecting customers in Australia. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's how it used to look. Um, this will disappear in about my next screen grab, but that was our little hint box because right from the beginning, what we tried to do was help people make sense of their learning. And what was happening and, um, was people were told to go and reflect on a thing or plan a thing. And, and they were working from blank, a blank sheet of paper. And it's incredibly difficult to get started when you've got a blank sheet of paper and you've had no chance to practice some of these things. So we were giving them little boxes that gave them, told them what to do, breaking it all down into bite-sized chunks. There would have been a hint down here which said, these are the kind of things you might want to put in your reflection field. Um, and this from... I think I first wrote this in about 2005. I wrote um, um, a paper for a chapter for a book by... Does anyone know Sarah De Freitas? She was over at... Um, is she at Murdoch still? But anyway, Sarah wrote, Sarah wrote a book, and this was in a chapter of the book, and I had to start thinking about what this thing was we, we, we built. And um, this talks about this idea that learners, of course, have lots of different identities. They're learning in lots of different places all the time. Um, and they should be able to record all of that learning wherever it happens. And they needed a platform to help them make sense of that, to integrate it, and then to share it with anyone they wanted to and have complete control over that. And that was that kind of idea of this being a, a digital theatre, you know, where the audience is invited in. So I think we've pretty much stayed true to that. But things have changed. Um, when you've got 50,000 students like you've got here, and people are using the platform for their professional accreditation or on professional routes. So you've had to give a bit around things like data and what information we share. But the idea of it being a personal space where you choose who sees what is still really important to us. Um, I think when we actually first had it in use here, I think when we showed the version, it was that version I've just shown you, um, the version that actually got uh, made available we're on the cusp of kind of changing, was this version, 1.2, I think this was. Um, and one of our first customers was Victoria University. Uh, and at the time, you could kind of change the interface and stuff a bit. <coughs> and there's a bit of a, like uh, Heidi said, can you kind of give some lessons learned as you go through? One of the lessons learned here was, and I'm, this is not me um, dissing this particular university, but uh, we had a phone call, something like, um, I don't know, first week of January or something like that, saying, hey, we'd like to run a micro-pilot on PebblePad. Well, what's a micro-pilot? Well, yeah, we, two weeks. 
want to get a pile of users in there for two weeks and see what it's like. So at the time, like, we'd take anybody's money. So <laughs> we said, yeah, OK. And uh, they started using it. And then like, within two weeks, they said, yeah, can we have an enterprise license, please? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. More trips to Australia, fantastic. Um, and they had it. But of course, what, what often happens is, uh, in fact, I might return to this. I've got a theme later about universities being somewhat dumb sometimes. <laughs> non here, obviously, uh, is um, they didn't know why they wanted it. You know, um, pro vice chancellors go to wine and cheese parties with other pro vice chancellors, and they say, oh, we've just bought a portfolio. Oh, we haven't got one of those. Quick, get me a new portfolio. <laughs> and uh, they have no idea what it's for. And I think that's what happened at VU. They kind of went and bought one, and ultimately it failed, because they, didn't, they hadn't kind of thought about how to use it, what they wanted to do with it, how they were going to support it how students would move between subjects with it. So well, that failed, but uh, so there's a lesson. And there's a, well, there's a lesson, for, lesson for us. We don't do pilots anymore because it, this is hard work. You, you guys who are innovating know that you make m loads of mistakes in the, in the first iteration and you change some of those in the second iteration. By the third time you do it, you're getting there. But actually you go back to somewhere close to the first iteration, but with a few, you know, you, it just keeps on moving all the time. And if you allow people to have a one-year license, they just say, oh, this didn't work for us. So we now only do three-year licenses. We grill people before they get the platform. We make them do implementation training. Because it's too big a thing to, to kind of get wrong. Um, I think that one of my favorite quotes was from a guy called Professor Oleg Lieber, um, who was professor of learning technologies at Bolton University, big uh, cheesing disc. And he talked about um, LMSs bringing about the amplification of the dissemination of content. Now that's kind of, now that's a real slur on LMSs, but in effect, a lot of people, particularly in the early days, that's what they did. They just put course notes on there, PowerPoints on there, module guides on there. So we had this amplification of dissemination of content. Um, and it, it pretty much uh, supported the way of teaching at the time. And so it was never particularly difficult getting an LMS in. But getting an e-portfolio platform in, or what we prefer to think of as a personal learning space, there is often a, there's a tension between some existing pedagogies and this new pedagogy. This pedagogy which is not about courses and content, but which is about learners and, and learning. And that takes a lot of effort, a lot of support, safe places to fall, and all of that uh, wrapped around it. And that just wasn't in place here. Anyway, that bit, that bit I've just done was meant to take five minutes. So <laughs> I may start talking quickly. Um, where, that was how we kind of ended up in Australia. Um, but how do we end up building Pebblepad? Well, this is our home, actually. This is from our website. This is the Innovation Centre at the University of Wolverhampton. Uh, and as I said, I, was a, I worked in the School of Education. I then became a, a principal lecturer in the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. And I, my main role was helping academics use technology to, to enhance learning. Um, before that, when I was in the School of Education, I ran a really big uh, module called Learning for Success, which was to... Uh, um, most students coming to Wolverhampton were first-generation students. We were basically teaching them the rules of the game, how to survive university. Um, this was our online, this was our VLE, stroke LMS. It was called Wolf. It was home built, one of the first ones in the world used at scale. Um, only this year, last year, did the university move from its own platform to Canvas. Just moved. But, so this is an LMS that's seen a lot, a lot of action. And uh, I took over this module, Learning for Success, and it had been trialed the previous semester in this first online iteration. And um, my boss at the time, Joe Allen, had commissioned some learning designers. The design a bit wasn't quite right. Some, some copy, copy typists to take everything that was written in our paper documents and put them into this. What they did, they put nice pictures on there and stuff. There was color and things. And you didn't have to physically turn a page. You clicked a button and you moved. Um, and we launched with this. And very quickly, I realized that's not really what you should do if, you've got, if you're you know, doing online learning. I don't know. I think, I, think, um, I mean, I've had you know, quite a portfolio career. I was a fireman for 11 years. Before that, I was a sailing instructor, uh, quite a high level, actually. And 
I, taught, I used to teach sailing instructors to teach sailing. And that's a very active thing. Um, once upon a time, someone um, gave me an old overhead projector. There must be people in the room who remember overhead projectors. <laughs> Are there people who still teach with overhead projectors? <laughs> Someone gave me an overhead projector. I'd actually, I think I was in hospital having an appendix out or something. I was recovering in hospital in the days where he kept you in overnight, you know, instead of just sending you out at the end of the day. And I had a whole pile of acetates, and I remember sitting in bed, like, drawing life jackets and parts of a sail and parts of a boat. And then I'd be I'd go teaching these sailing courses, and um, I'd bring everyone in from the beautiful, sunny day into a miserable clubhouse, put my OHP on and say, look, here's the parts of a boat. And it dawned on me that there were proper boats outside we could stand around <laughs> looking at. But it's funny, isn't it, the technology often you know, in, um, seduces you into using it just because it's there. Um, and, a, and what happened with Wolf was you know, all this content got to put on there without much thought. And, but soon I realized, because of everything I'd learned, I think, through sailing, or teaching sailing, that it needed to be much more active. And so um, I ran the, the module over several iterations, thousands of students, and kept on building in more and more activities. I think, going back to Prince, you know, think about different characterizations of curricula, I was probably doing a, a, a tool-based curricula, a resource-based curricula, because I kept looking at shiny things on the platform. I think, oh, how can we use that quiz feature? How can we use the forum? How can we? Um, so I did do that for a little while, but I think it was always about what can the students get out of this? How can, by them being active in this learning, can they learn something from it? So I got quite a lot of use out of, of Wolf. Unfortunately, because it was new at the time, it kept breaking. I'd ring up the IT support person, who was called Colin, who became my founder, co-founder of Pebblepad, and say, Colin, this has just lost students' work. Oh, just a minute, mate. Let me go on to the database. Oh, yeah, there's been a problem in the update. Sorry about that. They'll have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Colin, I've just marked all this work and I've sent, like, saved the feedback to everybody and it's gone. Oh, you know. Yeah, it's broken. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I, I genuinely, genuinely feel your pain when, if, you know, if anything we do causes that to you and it, it kind of causes us, like, really heartache when, when we get stuff wrong and stuff is, particularly when stuff is lost. If you click a button and something doesn't happen, okay. But when stuff is lost, that really does cause us pain because I know what it's like. Um, anyway, so we used Wolf. Uh, in fact, I was, I was searching for some screen grabs of Wolf and I just came across this. I'll talk about Julie Hughes in a bit. This is like the footer. People who use the old platform will remember underneath every asset you had these little bits which gave you a tree view of stuff that was in there and then all the information about the asset. And uh, Julie, who was one of the great innovators at Wolverhampton, um, started using, they had to use the LMS. That was an interesting thing as well. They had to use Wolf because the university policy said you have to have all first year modules on the LMS and so many percentages of other modules. Whether it was a good fit or not, it was a policy which drove some of the decisions that which were made. So Julie had to do that, but she created a, this was an old pebble pad portfolio. And she had a portfolio running alongside the LMS. And she had students creating portfolios of their learning as it went along. And you'll see the kind of style here is a sort of storying style. She's writing up about what happened in each class as it goes. Um, anyway, back to, to, to this. I think there's something I wrote in my little notes here about, um, about being an innovator. Um, it used to get me into, into trouble in a way because my boss, my fantastic boss at the time, um, Alison Holstead. No, in fact, my boss at the time here was, uh, was uh, Joe Allen. But latterly, um, uh, Alison as well, he used to give me all sorts of grief for not writing stuff, not producing papers. And I don't know if you have that same tension for some of you. That, but what, if, you're, if you're a teacher, what you're interested in is continually, you, do, you run a course, and you say, oh, next time I'm going to do this, and I'm going to change this around, and I have to do that. And there's quite a workload for that. And I, and I do feel for people who don't get given the support and the resources and the wee bit of time to innovate. Um, but you don't have time to write it up so you, because you're continually changing stuff. And, and, you, and it's not just the time, actually, because you make time. It's, it's not worth writing about yet because I know it's not right. I've learned all this stuff, and I'm going to implement it. And you keep on iterating, and it's a... Uh, 
you know, there's a chance, of, and it used to cause me all sorts of pain. So this is a lesson for you, maybe, is when you're doing some of this innovative stuff in Pelpad, do stop and write about it, because it will really annoy you when in three years' time you go to an event and see someone else bragging about what they've done and you did it three years ago. So get it down. Um, so uh, I should look at my notes at this point because I've kind of slightly gone off piste maybe. Um, we, um, oh, this is making me put the code in. Yeah, said that, said that, said that. Can you cut this bit in a bit? Uh, blah, 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 breaking, 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 uh, learners and things. Ah, so this was the bit I wanted to say here. Um, I think we'd move from this content-based stuff to activity-based, you know, using the, the form, just getting students to do things. Um, if I go back, maybe we can see this little profile thing. They used to be able to um, write 500, there's a 500-word limit in there. You could... Um, and I used to get them, one of the first things was to just to write 500 words about themselves. And I didn't, well, no, I was going to say I didn't care. I did really care because one of the big things about first-year students coming to university is the anonymity. They just lost in this sea of other people. And knowing something about them is probably one of those, you know this stuff, is one of the most powerful things you can do. But it also gave me a really quick insight into how they wrote. You know, whether they wrote in, like, tech speak or whether they kind of, what their level of grammar was like. And, and it gave you an opportunity really early to intervene. We used to get them to write quizzes. Um, rather than me do a quiz for them, we'd write quizzes, because actually writing quiz questions is a really complicated thing. And if you do it in competitive uh, context, they're trying to write really difficult questions because they don't want the other team to get the answers right. You don't care what the score is. You care that the fact they're learning stuff in writing those questions. Um, we used to do, um, you know, instead of learning the rules of quoting and paraphrasing, we get them to put up pieces of their you know, examples of quoting and paraphrasing and review each other's work. And what caused me real pain was um, when they left our module, all of that stuff was left behind. All of these traces of their learning and development were left because the LMS model at the time, and it's still pre prevalent in a lot of cases, is they get kicked out as the next cohort come in. There was no trace of their learning for them to look back on and develop you know, uh, l later on. Um, so uh, around, uh, so I've, you've seen this one, sorry. Uh, and this was that thing about, you know, the, we knew the, the social space thing was emerging. Well, of course, I mean, is Flickr still around? I don't know. I'm not even sure about, yeah, Flickr is still there. Uh, Blogger, um, I'm not sure about, um, on a previous one, of this, um, uh, what was that thing called, all the bands used to, MySpace. You know, so many social tools just disappear off a, off a cliff. Anyway, there was this institutional space, and what we were doing was putting this kind of middle bit. Um, it was institutionally provided, but the stuff was owned and created by the learner. They could go back to it, they could interpret all their learning. Um, this kind of space in the middle. Um, around the same time, I was getting interested in web quests. Has anyone come across web quests? Yeah, so uh, when the internet became a thing, um, most, um, most teachers you know, knew they had to you know, get their students using the Tinter web. And so they'd say, go and research, I don't know, uh, behaviorism. And they'd, got, they'd type behaviorism into Northern Light or Google, I think, was around. Remember the Northern Light? So they'd type, they'd type it in. And then um, they'd, they'd find all this stuff and they'd print page after page after page of stuff. And that was their research, just all this stuff they printed off the, off the web. And web quests were a really nice way of structuring learning activities. So, well, here's a problem. Um, something about maybe um, uh, a, a project to build a thing somewhere. Uh, and the thing about this building this thing is it's on a land which is sort of um, scientifically interesting because of the flora or fauna. Um, but actually, it's really adjacent to a town that's just suffering. It's got to depopulation because there's not many jobs there. There's low level of uh, income. And you kind of set this kind of context and you'd... you'd point people off to different resources on the web. So you do a bit of research yourself. Give people different tasks. And off they go and do you know, pretty amazing work. A lot of scaffolding in that. So you can see why I was kind of interested in it. But the difficulty was that um, to build a web quest at the time, you had to be, have a friendly learning tech. And the problem at the time with learning techs, and I, and I know it's a different, because um, you, now you're all beautiful and wonderful. At the time, learning techs were kind of often IT geeky people. And they had their own view, sorry, you know, the world has changed, generally. But they would, they would subvert what you were trying to do. Or you were trying to do something 
for some point in time and it would never get done in time and there was no control for teachers. Teachers always had to um, do their work through someone else. So we built this thing called WebQuest Wizard and it kind of gave you, you know, little hints, hints and tips again about how to, what to put in the boxes, pick really nice designs so your stuff look good so you're proud of it, uh, put tag, uh, tags on it so that people could find them because they were published to an open space or shared resource. Um, so we built this. So, and I think what happened really then was this WebQuest wizard, we built something called profileability as well, which allowed users to say how good they were at things and what evidence they had of that and write some comments and make development plans. Um, and there was this sort of sense of institutional technologies weren't really doing what we wanted. Uh, and all of that came together in Pebblepad, really. Um, at the time, it was called uh, PACE. So this system, when it first launched, was called PACE, and that was because at the university, which gave us a great support, um, they, were, they had a project which was personal academic careers and employability thing. So this was the PACE tool thing. And it, it didn't seem to me that it was very catchy. So um, the pad bit, the reason it got into its name, which people often ask about, um, was the pad was always capitalized originally. Uh, oh, it says pace on there. Um, the pad was for personal achievement diary. And the intention was that whenever you did something which was significant, you could record it in your, in a way, digital online diary. And the pebble bit was just a nice word. Pebble, I thought, would make nice merchandise in the future. Uh, so that's how the name came about. A lot of people talk about, oh, yeah, I know why it's called Pebble Pace, because like, you toss your pebble into the pool of learning and the ripples. and There's all, so <laughs> there's all sorts of stories constructed around the name, but it's, it's a bit dull. It was Pebble because it's a nice word and pad for personal achievement diary. Um, so you, you can clearly never do this stuff on your own. Um, Wolverhampton was, was great. And even when we started the business, when we, moved, when we outgrew the garage, they let us kind of... Uh, squat in various corners of the of the university, using its excellent uh, Wi-Fi facilities. Um, Julie Hughes, a really early innovator, did fantastic stuff. And I was thinking on the way in, actually, um, one of Julie's students, who, one of the very first students to use PebblePad, is now. Um, has anyone met Emma, um, Emma Pennell? Yeah, a few people. So Emma's now um, senior learning technologist at the University of Plymouth, um, really, you know, uh, advocating the use of PellPad and other technologies, whether appropriate. Um, one of Julie's other students, Rachel Challen, worked for us for a bit. She's now um, head of learning technology at um, uh, Nottingham Trent University, or in the, in, sorry, in the faculty of interesting stuff. Can't remember which one. <coughs> um, Alison Halstead was my boss at KELT, Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. And Alison was, I went meant to Alison once and said, Alison, I've got this great idea. Um, how about if we take a bunch of academics and we put them in a hotel for a week with a few learning, uh, blended learning advisors and we just do fun stuff and see what comes out of it? Um, and she said, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, most bosses would go mental at something like that. And we did that. And, and these academics taken away from their day-to-day -day stuff and working with some support, sharing ideas, created the most amazing um, learning uh, designs and, um, uh, and went on to kind of do really interesting things in the university. And JISC, um, JISC was a funding body that used to provide grants. And, so, and basically, we wrote a grant for the University of Wolverhampton to implement portfolios really early on. Um, JISC funded that, and Wolverhampton paid us as this pledging business to support their rollout of PebblePad, which meant we had money to buy another developer and then another developer, and that's how the whole business has always grown. Um, conscious now running out of time. So here's some stuff that was created in that early version. Uh, this was the early version of Profiler. Um, the blog. The blog's an interesting one. I was at a conference in Vancouver, and I started hearing about blogs, and I called the captain. Captain's our really brainy back-end developer thing. Captain, um, we haven't got a blog. Leave it with me. Next day, we had a blog in PebblePad. I promise you that's true. Um, but that was in the days when we didn't, do, we didn't have to worry too much about accessibility or LTI or how putting a blog as a page in a portfolio which is nested in a workbook. All of those things kind of made life a bit more difficult, doesn't it? But you can see all the way through, it's these little chunks of learning um, that kind of come together and demonstrate what people have learned. That's, none of that has changed. 
um, we started seeing more and more uh, um, sophisticated, complex use of the platform, supporting things like foundation degrees. Two quotes that came to me from Julie Hughes, this idea of storying. You know, we do tell stories as humans, and we choose which bits of our story to share. Having control of that is really, really important. Uh, we never wanted to have a tick box portfolio. We wanted it always to be story-based wherever possible. Um, and this idea uh, from um, Baum about um, it, your portfolio being like a compost heap. And this is a learning design thing you need to, I guess, understand. You can't just say to people, do stuff, do stuff, do stuff, do stuff, do stuff. You have to give them opportunities to go back and turn that stuff over. Pick back through it and see what's interesting, what themes emerge from that. And that's, uh, that's how you get the very best kind of compost. Um, uh, more stuff, more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. Um, although this was, I mean, this bit here, you know, what we were seeing really early on, what the students started to do their writing was a sense of, actually, so many examples of this. Oh, actually, I should be at university. I am capable of doing this. I'm proud of you know, things I've done. Um, more stuff from Julie, who started using the platform a lot for her own professional development, and we're seeing lots of that going on now. Uh, lots of professional bodies using the platform, used for you know, professional accreditation, grants, and stuff. Um, and Julie got a national teaching fellowship in the UK for her work around portfolios, which was super. Um, so I did want to give a shout out to Julie because you know, without, without people at particular points along the way, we definitely wouldn't be here. Um, so what was this thing we built? Um, we used to call it an e-portfolio. Now I tend to think an e-portfolio is just a story. And you have lots of e-portfolios, lots of stories for different audiences. Um, so it's not an e-portfolio, which is how we actually branded it for a while. Um, then we thought, hmm, not just an e-portfolio because people didn't like the idea of it not being an e-portfolio. Because if, if you're going into a tender process for someone who's looking for a portfolio, why has this just died? Um, if you're going into a tender process and someone's after a portfolio and you're not a portfolio, it's tricky. Then we became a personal learning space. Then we became a personal learning platform because space just sounded, sounded a bit woolly for universities. Uh, and then the reality is we're a personal learning and assessment space because in, in an institutional context, assessment is a really big driver of learning. And I don't just mean like formal kind of, you know, you've got a B plus for this. All of that stuff wrapped around your peer review, uh, self-assessment, um, um, and all of that stuff you know about. Um, but it's still hard to describe what Pelpad is. Um, shout out to Terry as well. Um, this idea of it being a Swiss army knife. Um, Quite early on, we went away with a bunch of academics from Cumbria University and asked them to draw what Pebblepad was. Um, and there's this kind of, I, I've used this lots. So I think it's a lovely picture to try and capture something which is quite complex. You know, that you create these assets or you receive them from someone else um, and then you sort of share them and you get feedback on them. And that makes it a sort of enhanced, enhanced asset, this kind of circular kind of connected thing. And I just love the bit about flaunting your assets. I and mean, actually, we, we had some badges at one point that we used to give out, you know, about flaunting your assets. Um, they never went down very well in America, I have to say. I don't know why it was. <laughs> how, you, how do we carry on developing PebblePad? Well, we're not clever enough to come up with all the good ideas that go into the system. We watch what's going on. This trip alone, we've spoken to about 130 people. Um, we spoke to about 35 people yesterday. We're always really eager to hear what we can do better, what, what things you'd like to see in the system. Um, seeing stuff going on at Sydney uh, some time ago, they were using uh, portfolios for lab reports, and the idea was they'd create a sort of template portfolio, share it to all of the students doing the lab reports. They'd all take a copy and then change what was in there. Uh, likewise, at La Trobe, they had this long walk thing, an 18-day walk in the Kosciuszko mountain range, and there'd be a templated portfolio that said, you know, how are you preparing for the walk? What are you expecting to see along the way? What are your reflections after you've done it? And because people, what happened when, if I create a portfolio and I share it with you all and you take a copy of it, guaranteed, 10 seconds after you've copied it, I realize there's a spelling mistake in it or I've missed a page. So that's where workbooks came from. This idea that you could have something which you could share with everybody, but still have editing rights over the structure and content of it, but which students could make their own by adding their own work and 
that stuff into it. And this is an example from the Institute of Swimming in the UK. Who've done, you know, they trained something like 55,000 uh, swimming coaches at all levels. And all, they don't have an LMS. All of their work is done through these bite-sized workbooks. You know, read a bit of stuff, talk about it, show evidence that you can do it. It's cut down, by the way, their poolside assessments from a five-day program on site to two days because all the work is kind of demonstrated in advance and they just turn up and do the actual kind of checking of that, yeah. Um, and lovely work that happened just um, down the road at uh, Southern Cross University. They took a, a whole of a master's in social work and turned it into 11 topic-based workbooks. And the beauty of that was these social work these people who were practicing social workers didn't have all their stuff locked up in the LMS. They had these to keep on referring back to and you know, checking between them and uh, just wonderful. Unfortunately, the team that did this, oh, the team that did this, by the way, we launched uh, workbooks in something like um, <coughs> uh, January and they were running this in February. They did all the work. They got together, the whole course team, right across, fantastic work. And then the university said, by the way, we're not using PebblePad anymore. Uh, yeah, so what have we learned along the way? Sorry, uh, Heidi, she's moving in. What we've learned, what we've learned is we should have built an LMS because that's where the big money is. And if you see what's been happening with Canvas, it's growing and growing and growing. I should have built Canvas. But no, because actually, you know, for me, it's not about courses and content, it's about learners and learning. And that's not this, LMSs offer many more options now. But I think there were this thing about learning across contexts, this thread running across all your learning, I think there's a, a really big space for that. Um, I learned not to show exemplary stuff. I used to use Julie Hughes' stuff all the time. And I'd say, hey, look at this, isn't it absolutely wonderful? And a lot of people were, oh, I could never do that. So at ECU, Heather's here, fabulous, fabulous work about integrating the uh, portfolio use across the entirety of a program with lots of little touch points where people are gathering information, making sense of it, these stage portfolios. In some places, if you showed that, that's just too much. So there's a, there's a thing about using exemplary work carefully. Does anyone recognize this guy? Oh, I'm so disappointed. There's a, I thought I was being clever by stealing a grab from an advert that's running at the moment from ANZ about the home buyer app thing. So this is Angus. There's a guy walking around with the app and he knows, tells him all the right questions to ask about the house. This guy, Angus, just goes around like you know, clicking the floorboards and looking in cupboards. And this was my slide to represent universities, sometimes not knowing what they're looking for. And that, one of the examples I may have used earlier, I shouldn't name them again, um, that they, they go, oh, we need a portfolio. Well, that's a portfolio, that's a portfolio. Well, that's a portfolio. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo will have that one. And not thinking, because the portfolio bit doesn't matter whether we are or aren't a portfolio. It's what are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? What's the learning outcomes? What's your expectations? What's your vision for this? And it doesn't matter what the system's called. It's working out what you're trying to achieve with it. Uh, do you start small, sorry, or go really big? Let a thousand flowers bloom? I don't know the answer to that question. Normally, I'd say start small. You've not started small. You've started really, really big, and you've made a fabulous job of it. And, uh, and I said to Heidi yesterday, you know, a year ago, Heidi was saying, who can we talk to about implementing? And we we're pointing at a few people now when people say, who do we talk to about implementing? Griffith, Griffith, Griffith. You've done a fantastic job. Design is really important. Met loads of blended learning advisors yesterday um, and educational technologists. Learning design is absolutely essential. You know, what's the learning all about here? And which bits of the platform work? And which bits, in fact, should we use PebblePad at all? Is a better platform to achieve the learning goals we have? Uh, language, resources, assets, blah, blah, blah. We're working on that. We're going to try and simplify it even further. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a kind of group thing. We're learning from you all the time um, about how we, how we keep making the platform better. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we're doing stuff. We, like, we, we've got 138 things from like the last day and a bit, and, and Heidi's one this morning. Basically, we're going to improve Atlas, make it a world-class e-submission feedback system, improving the workbook and portfolio look and feel, so they, they are really, really similar. Um, looking at programmable outcomes um, and data. We do have to get more and more data out. There's so many projects going on around um, um, learning, anal learning analytics, and we've always been really, really protective of our data, so we have to kind of let some of that out a bit more. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>